I feel the strongest thing is always if it happened in your body or in someone's body. That's enormous. A worm in, in, a, in a living body. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just under the skin and you see how it moves. Ooh, well, well. Yeah, I, I hate worms and snakes and things like that. I, it's awful. Ooh. The chestburster scene is perhaps the most memorable scene in the movie, but despite as simple as it would seem to make a baby xenomorph, this was the most difficult of the three alien phases to design. On March 11th, 1978, work had begun on the chestburster design. This was the scene that got the script sold, and would arguably be the most important and difficult scene to shoot in the movie. Oh my God. <laughs> Instead of getting a sponsor for this video, I made another video of my favorite alien merchandise that I've gotten over the two years of making this series. Check it out. I've never seen anything like it. The team decided that the chestburster should be blind, and Giger suggested that the teeth should be the focal point of the creature since it had to bite its way out of Kane's body. After looking at various art pieces, Scott suggested it should resemble something from Francis Bacon's Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion paintings. Scott wanted it to be an obscene phallic thing that was all mouth, aiming to tap into deep, private fears. Using this as inspiration, Giger made a painting in the London apartment he had been loaned for the production. However, Giger didn't like how it turned out, noting that it sort of looked like a plucked turkey. He knew that since it was a baby version of the full-size xenomorph, the design would probably change once they pinned down exactly what the big creature would look like. The paintings by Bacon were also meant to inspire aspects of the adult xenomorph, and you can see in this painting how it likely inspired the iconic xenomorph's second pop-out mouth. To build the chestburster, Roger Dickin was given the Bacon painting and Giger's painting, which Dickin also thought looked like a plucked turkey. He was surprised that they really wanted him to make that weird-looking thing, but he was told that it shouldn't be too complicated because it just had to pop out of Kane's chest and flop onto the table. Dickin wasn't sure this chicken chestburster would work, but he went ahead, sculpting it out of plasticine and casting it in foam plastic with latex skin. He made the puppet three times its actual size with the idea being that it would be a puppet someone could wear on their hand, and there would be a scaled-up chest that it would come out of. The whole process took about three weeks. As you can see, it does look pretty similar to Giger's painting, but while it was scary on paper, it was very much the opposite in real life. Dickon brought it from his workshop an hour away to the studio so Scott and Carol could check it out. And he came in with his arm bound up with a sack around it, and he looked really, you know, um, not a happy fella. And uh, we see a lot of talk and a lot of preamble, and obviously he was embarrassed about it. He took it off, and it looked it was very funny because it looked like a turkey on his arm. Scott said, Dickon propped it on his knee, and while he was talking, he kept moving the head around so the bloody thing kept looking back and forth across the room, from Gordon Carroll to me, and then up his nose. The whole thing was entirely comical. It looked like some kind of a plucked, demented turkey, wrinkled and ancient looking, like some malevolent Muppet. I was frankly terrified at the thought of getting a giggle at this time in the film, so we ditched the whole concept and started again. The new idea was to get the design of the full-sized alien fully figured out, and then make a baby version of that for the chestburster. <laughs> Scott also decided that he wanted to put the chestburster in the same shot as the actors, so it couldn't be scaled up anymore. It had to be actual size. Scott was worried that too much input was what made the other alien designs so difficult to figure out, so he was much more secretive about the chestburster. Not even screenwriter and visual design consultant Dan O'Bannon got to see it until it was finished. The final design ended up taking ideas from Giger, Dickon, Scott, and even a little from producer Gordon Carroll. They wanted the chestburster to have a smooth look, and they knew that the head would be long like in the original Xenomorph concept. So they just had to decide if it would have its head tilted up or down to fit in the chest like a fetus. They decided to have the head tilted up to look, quote, more obscene that way, more reptilian, more phallic. The chestburster would be a lot more straightforward than the facehugger. It was pretty much just a handheld puppet. In mid-April, Scott went to Dickens' workshop about an hour's drive from Shepperton Studios to see how the clay model of the new chestburster was coming along. It looked pretty much like it did in the final film, except it had little dinosaur legs. 
So Scott pulled the legs off, put little bits of clay on the side to look almost like dolphin flippers behind the head, and said, there, that's it. Dickens said that it was basically just the head of the full-size alien with a tail on the end. The metallic teeth were made out of epoxy with vacuum pour metal added. The problem now was that they wanted it to be actual size instead of scaled up, which meant that it would be too small to be operated like a hand puppet. Dickon mounted it on a curved metal rod with a hand grip on the bottom and ran a wire down it that could be pulled to make it bend its head forward. There were rubber squeeze bulbs that would use air to make the little jaw open and gills pulse, and finally a tube that they could squeeze to make saliva come out. Scott liked the finished product, saying that it looked very odd and spooky. Dickon noted that the most difficult part was that the model was so small and detailed that if he needed to fix anything, it would be very difficult to open it up and change something without destroying the whole thing. Soon, the time came to finally shoot the scene that would be the centerpiece of the entire movie. The day before shooting the actual chestburster popping out, they filmed the entire lead-up with Kane convulsing on the table. You might have noticed a little visual hint that Ash is aware that something might happen to Kane because he saw it on the monitor. There is a shot of Ash smiling along with everyone, and then he starts to look inquisitively at Kane, and the camera begins to turn to Kane eating. It cuts very quick in the movie, but I managed to find the raw take, and I'm happy to say that Scott did originally fully pan the camera, but I imagine he cut it short to preserve the surprise that Ash has ulterior motives. The scene is so brilliantly staged to begin with something like choking or a seizure that grounds the action in something medically realistic and distressing before heightening it with something fantastical. Somewhere in there, there would be an airline on his, on, his, on his chest, which would let off a blast of air in pink, which will go Ch like that. <laughs> After that, clear the set. Then we go in and we basically screw down a artificial chest onto the table. The part that always really sold it for me was Yafet Koto's reaction when we first see the blood. <laughs> it's enough for everyone to stop everything and his frozen look of disbelief that gets interrupted by the seizure continuing. This performance by John Hurt masterfully sells the entire reality of the scene, but Hurt nearly wasn't involved with the production at all. What are you talking about? I know, it's hard to imagine Alien without John Hurt, but there was actually a different actor cast to play Kane. John Finch, who had achieved fame in the role of Macbeth in Roman Polanski's adaptation, was originally cast to play Kane. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. However, on the first day of shooting, he began to sag in his seat and turn yellow. Scott asked him if he was alright, and Finch replied that he felt terrible and asked how he looked. Scott told him he looked terrible too and Finch had to be carried away for medical attention. What they discovered was that Finch was having some major issues with his diabetes and would have to drop out of the production. The production had originally wanted John Hurt for the role, but he was unavailable at the time. When Finch left the production, Hurt's availability had opened up, and Scott quickly arranged a meeting. Scott met with Hurt late at night to discuss the role, and Hurt agreed to take it on. He would arrive on the set at 7.30 the next morning to begin shooting. He hadn't seen his script at all, all he knew about the movie is what Scott told him the night before. I'm sure Finch is a fine actor, but with all the lucky breaks this production ultimately had among the stressful time crunch, to have a lead actor drop out on the first day and be immediately replaced by Scott's first choice meant that there was no footage of Finch to reshoot and pretty much no time wasted. The chestburster scene was the first time any of the crew would see what any of the alien creature designs looked like. Giger was still working on the big version, which no one was allowed to see and Dickon had done the facehugger and chestburster in his home workshop. All the cast knew was the scene as it was written. O'Bannon said, It took a long time to set up the shot, and except for John Hurt, none of the actors were allowed on the set. The footage preceding the actual effect they had already shot, all yakety yak and eating, and then John Hurt choking and falling across the table with everybody yelling and grabbing his arms and legs. They did all that the previous afternoon. The next day, they were going to take it from that point on, and a lot of people on the crew who really weren't involved in the scene started showing up, myself included. We all staked out strategic spots around the set and waited. Everybody wanted to watch. Ron, she said, and Dan O'Bannon, who were the original writers uh, who'd come up with this chestburster concept, and they were like over on the side like, <laughs> like this, like it was Christmas or something. They were very merry. They'd already cut a hole in the table so John Hurt could get underneath and put his head and arms out, then they put this false chest up over him that was made of fiberglass with a big round hole cut in the middle of it and slots to fit over his shoulders. 
For John to get himself into a configuration where it looked natural, his shoulders and arms and head in relation to that chest, he really had to twist back into a pretty uncomfortable position. The initial plan was to use Dickens' handheld puppet for the sequence, but Scott and the effects team began to think something more was needed. Brian Johnson said, Roger wanted to do the whole thing by hand from under the table, but we figured by the time we got John Hurt in position, along with all the other gear we'd be needing, there just wasn't going to be enough room for Roger to get in there and exert the kind of pressure we wanted. He wouldn't have the leverage, so we decided what we needed was some kind of a hydraulic-type mechanism to get that initial violent thrust through the chest. Scott also wanted to do several takes and wanted something that could precisely repeat what it had just done. Dickon preferred to just do the effect himself but was beginning to worry that he was being difficult to work with, so he agreed. Dickens said, I made a slush rubber cast of the chest burster, without the tail, and filled it up with plaster and put a metal rod in it which had a hole on the bottom, so they could bolt it into something. There was also a loose lower jaw with a pin through it, and a piece of wire to pull it open, but that's all. It couldn't do anything else. Nick Alder made a cantilever device that would force the puppet out of the dummy chest, the device was placed under the table between Hurt's body and the dummy chest, which had been bolted down. Then they filled the fake chest with real organs from a local butcher shop and ran hoses that would spray the fake blood. O'Bannon said that Scott was so detailed with his preparations that he spent over a half hour draping a little piece of beef organ so it would hang out of the creature's mouth. The final touch was cutting the back of a t-shirt and putting it over the fake chest. When the rest of the cast were finally called onto the set, they found what looked like just the top half of John Hurt laying on the table smoking a cigarette, the crew working in coveralls, and three cameras covered in clear plastic. O'Bannon thought the cast looked a bit uneasy finding what looked like something rigged to explode, and three cameras, which meant that they would probably only have one shot at the effect. The actors walk in and they see that waiting for them. And I saw them, their faces all sort of dropped. They all sort of went, like this, and their eyes got big and roamed around all over this stuff. And I see Sigourney looks really scared. I thought, boy, she's really getting into character. I said, good, Sigourney, you, you're really up for this. She said, no, I'm pretty scared. I know it's going to happen live because the cameras have cellophane over them. There's going to be a lot of blood, isn't there? <laughs> they could actually do it as many times as needed to get it right, but it's likely that Scott wanted the cast to feel that added pressure, because he knew that the one thing that couldn't be replicated were the first reactions. Scott said, If an actor's just acting terrified, he never quite goes over the top and you don't get that genuine look of raw animal fear. What I wanted was sort of a hardcore reaction, and I thought it best to give the actors an edge by not familiarizing them totally with what was going to happen. So when we started the scene, all three cameras were on the actors rather than the table. They had used some different chemicals to make part of the shirt weak enough for the thing to bust through. With the cast in position, the crew ready, and the cameras finally rolling, the sequence began. O'Bannon said, John began working up to his level of agony, and the rest of them started grabbing onto him and shouting like they had the night before. Finally, Ridley said, hit it, and the head started bumping against the shirt, but it wouldn't break through. The acid hadn't weakened it enough. There was blood spreading all over the shirt, though, and the thing was bumping around inside, and that in itself was enough to scatter the actors. Cut it. What's happening? Lock it. Hold the blood. Ah! Oh. oh my god. Action. Oh, my Strangely enough, with the articulated puppet, blood tubes, and organs, it was the shirt that caused the most problems. The creature had to break through the chest and shirt to be visible in the shot. Dickens said, Whilst working in my studio, the production company badgered me into allowing the resident effects studio to create a solid version of my chest burster to be worked on a cantilever affair as a backup. On the day of shooting, this unnecessary and expensive paraphernalia was rigged up, and on the word action, it jackhammered up and down through the hollow chest built around John Hurt without busting through the t-shirt as expected, and was, as I anticipated, a total waste of time. Scott actually liked that the shirt didn't tear for the first few attempts, so it would look like it's violently trying to burst out. The crew quickly switched out the bloody shirt to try again, this time cutting the spot on the shirt with several small cuts from a razor blade, and it worked. During the take, Dickens' puppet broke through the shirt, which he thought would have looked cooler coming out slowly, but Scott wanted the shock of it bursting out. O'Bannon said, One of the problems was that the control was not very subtle. They'd hit the lever and there'd be this loud hiss. Oh 
and this thing would just come shooting out of there like a jack-in-the-box locked into position. Ridley was kind of bothered by that, and he'd say, can't you make it seem like it's struggling out? So they tried giving it little bursts of air, but when they did, it just kind of bounced up and down. All in all, they did four takes. I'm okay, I'm okay. On one of the takes, Veronica Cartwright just happened to be standing in the path of one of the blood tubes and got drenched. I was so taken aback. My knees hit the back of the bank head and I flipped upside down and I had two cowboy boots sticking up. I turn over, I realize they're still shooting. I have to get up and I continue acting. Six gallons of fake blood were pumped out onto the set during each take and it took an hour and a half to reset everything for the next take, including rearranging all of the set dressing and a change of costume for the actors. They removed the whole chestburster mechanism, and Roger Dickon climbed under the table with his articulated puppet that he operated by hand. There were five or six people set to operate the chestbursting effect. Roger Dickon was the one to actually push the puppet through the chest. Slow, Roger, and blood push out. A few held John Hurt in place, and some ran the blood pumps, making sure the fake blood squirted out in time with a heartbeat. It was extremely cramped with Dickon, the blood tubes, and the bottom half of John Hurt, all hiding under the table. This is the lower half of Hurt's body, and these are Dickon's legs with the red pants. And then there was quite a long time as uh, one prop man underneath the table kept pushing this alien on a stick, saying, Is it coming through yet, Eric? Can you see it? Is it coming through? He says, No, not yet, Alf. You know, a lot of that was going on. Dickon operated the mouth while other crew members moved the gills and pumped saliva out of its mouth. Dickon made the mouth open for it to give what they called its birth cry. And slow, Roger, and blood push, push out. Pulse okay. it more. The round. Cut it. Scream, head back. Scream, and go. Okay, and the head back. Snarl, go! Shit, it's great. Cut it. Cut Save the blood. For the sound, they first tried distorting a baby cry, but it sounded ridiculous, so they invented a sound by mixing the baby cry with a pig squeal. For the shot of the chestburster escaping, they made a slit in the table where the puppet was mounted on a track. Then they positioned the camera at a low angle to hide the slit. Dickon was laying on his back on a trolley under the table and holding the chestburster on a rod through the slit. During the take, crew members would yank the trolley across the floor. The funny thing is that the puppet had had a tail hanging down for the shot of it bursting through the chest, but they wanted the tail to whip around as it scurried away. Two! So Dickon attached another tail around the bottom of the puppet and his wrist, and they attached a tube with compressed air into the tail to make it wave around. The first time they did the shot, the chest burster ran straight into a bowl, and they had to do it again. So, for the scene, it took three puppets to complete the effect. One to burst out of the chest, another articulated one for the close-up that could open its mouth and bulge, and the last one that would run out of the room. The chest burster scene became absolutely iconic and horrified many audience members. And check out this picture from a test screening. I just want to know what's going on in this guy's mind. One person who seemed to have been horrified was Stanley Kubrick, who called Scott shortly after seeing the movie. And he said, he came straight to it, not how are you doing. He said, I, I need to ask you a question. I just look at Alien. He said, how the hell did he get that thing to come out of his chest? And I said, well, we had I'll a- never tell you, you said. No, I said, <laughs> no. I said well, I had a fake chest. I pinned a t-shirt over, I had a razor blade, and I said, I, he said, I got it, thank you. He hung up. When the Academy Awards took place, Alien won for Best Visual Effects, and the awards went to H.R. Giger, Carlo Rambaldi, who made the mechanical xenomorph head, Dennis Ayling, who directed the filming of the miniatures, and special effects supervisors Brian Johnson and Nick Alder. Roger Dickon got nothing, despite the facehugger being the creature that gets the most screen time, and the chestburster being the centerpiece of the movie. What the hell is that? Dickon had a miserable time working on the movie, with nobody really knowing exactly what they wanted. The whole experience bummed him out, and he never watched any of the other Alien movies. Dickon died at the age of 84 in February of 2024. I hope this video somehow spreads the word and helps give Dickon the recognition he deserves. I know I'll never see the facehugger and chestburster the same way again. When the movie came out, it was rated R, but with Star Wars reviving the science fiction genre, people weren't expecting Alien to be so brutal. The thing comes out the chest and there's an eruption in the theater of outrage. Too mad. Outrage. 
And I never, I got a little worried, so I got up and struck out and met him in the bar later. <laughs> so I was a bit worried about the outrage because people were incensed that it was so violent. And when the chest burster happened, what was interesting, there were some reactions, because at that point I was standing on the side and I was on about the third preview, watching them with curiosity more than anything now, because I was starting to witness um, real uh, terror. Did you know that this was an R-rated movie when you brought him? Yes, we did. Are you sorry you brought him? Yes, <laughs> I am. Are you glad you saw it? Alien proved so popular that Fox quickly launched a series of toys and other merchandise aimed ironically at children and teenagers, a target audience technically too young to see the movie. Are you sorry, sir, that you brought your son along to see Alien? No, ma'am, I think you should have seen it. It's something that he needs to know that things could like that could happen in life. That could be a true story. It's amazing to me that we got such an iconic movie with such incredible designs. When we've learned in this series that a final design was never actually chosen for the Nostromo, Gordon Carroll and Dan O'Bannon tried to sabotage Giger's derelict spaceship design, the establishing shot of the space jockey was before it was painted, Dickon was constructing the facehugger off of vague references to pieces of Giger's paintings before Dan O'Bannon just made a sketch, and now everything with the chestburster. And if you think all of that is crazy, just wait till you hear the story behind making the full-size xenomorph, which is the next episode. Oh no, not again. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime guy. 